Welcome back again to this uh, course on leadership and this is going to be the lecture number four. And this lecture is going to be devoted to one of the most important theories, modern theories of leadership, which is situational leadership. We are going to be talking about situational leadership in this lecture number four and in the next lecture number five. So when we talk about situational leadership, you might have already an idea, uh, an intuition about what situational leadership may entail. But let's start with the origins of this theory. The origins of this theory are rooted in a scholar, American a scholar, Clem Blanchard, who originally developed this situational leadership model along with Paul Hersey from uh, Ohio University in 1968. One year after, the model became prominent with the publication of the classic text Management of Organizational Behavior, which is now in its seventh edition and it's published by Prentice Hall. So if you really want to get a good taste of what uh, situational leadership is, I really advise you to have it access to this book, you can borrow it from library, in your local library, uh, or you can order online from other channels. It is very interesting to have a look how this sort of modern theory of leadership, which has been rooted in the past, has still its application in today's uh, modern world. In the early 80s, uh, he was a professor of leadership and organizational behavior at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. In 1979, he funded the Clem Blanchard Companies, a group that deals with training and development, management, consulting, etc. Right? So, which are the basic ideas behind situational leadership? I already told you that perhaps situational gives you already a hint, an idea of what does it mean. So, when you are trying to apply a leadership, and remind what we said already, leadership is about influencing others. Okay, You can be a good leader or a bad leader, of course. We know from history several leaders that have not been good leaders. But they have been leading people, they were influencing people and people's behavior. And many people were following those examples. Adolf Hitler is one of those. Do hmm? you remember that several dictators history have been or they were leaders somehow and they were not precisely uh, trying to elevate the spirits or the growth of those who were leading they were commanding so they were hierarchically vertically imposing their ideas and they command All right so when we are talking about this situational leadership it is something which is related to this to this very quotation here that we have in front of us. Situational leadership, it's about applying different styles with different people. Different styles with the same people, depending on the goal or task. Interesting, right? So, you have to be as a leader, flexible enough. You have to refine your perception antennas to apply differentially leadership styles and strategies according to the people you have in front of you. One day, I remember, I had a conversation with, with, mine, with one of, of my colleagues at the university. And he is a, a father of three sons. And we were having lunch together and he was saying that, you know, once I declare in front of all my family, because one of my sons were claiming and were protesting because I was treating my other son differently. Say, yes, I'm treating him differently. He's different from you. He might have also different needs. I might have different ways of communicating with him. Why should I treat him equally as you? So, of course, there is a question of justice, there is a question of 
uh, non-discrimination, but that's another different thing. We're talking here about the adaptation of your behavior, of your leadership style, according to the person you have in front of you. You cannot treat the same people the same way, because we are all different. So as a leader, you have to develop this intuition, this sense that is going to allow you, this sixth sense that is going to allow you to detect what is needed for whom. You might also apply different styles with the same people, again, depending on the goal or task. You might be treating the same people regularly on several issues that you are doing, same tasks that are being repeated systematically, but sooner or later you will have to face another step and you will have to use the workforce, the intelligence, the resource that you have in your collaborator to do something new, to do something different. So according to that, according to this task that may vary, that can change, then you will have to apply different leadership style also with the same people, with the same person, adapting to the role that you want to achieve. Okay? So this is the basic of the idea of the situational leadership. Which are the main skills for developing situational leadership? There are two main things. These two main con concepts are diagnosis and flexibility. Okay? So remind what we said in lecture number two when we were talking about diagnosis. It is very important to have the resources, the capacity, the intelligence to conduct proper analysis, to do proper diagnosis. That is going to allow you to better understand what's the big picture without perhaps entering the small details that are providing some noise in the system, but they are not giving you a real sense of what is happening in the bigger picture. So it is very important to do that. It is very important to devote energy, resources, attention and effort to elaborate good diagnosis. Those diagnoses, though, are not only done by the leader. It is a teamwork. It has to be shared. It has to be constructed by others because others might have different views from you. And that's going to be complementary. This complementary view is going to allow you to have a better understanding of what's happening there once you step back and you can see the entire situation having access to quality information. But apart from conducting high quality diagnoses, which are of course very important as we have said, then you will have to act afterwards. You have seen the things that are working, the things that are not working. But then, after that, you will have to develop an action plan. And normally what happens very often in companies is that we elaborate a lot of reports and we spend a lot of hours in meetings and we elaborate a lot of diagnoses for the sake of doing them. Once we have done this diagnosis, those reports, then we take the reports and put, the, and put them under the table. And they remain there. We have done the exercise. We feel comfortable with that. The homework, it's been done. Tick the box. It's not enough. Then, once you have developed an action plan, the toughest thing is not the diagnosis itself. It is the application the implementation. And normally, one of the difficulties or one of the main obstacles why people don't want to commit with the application of this action plan is because they fear criticism. It is better to elaborate a good diagnosis, to write up a nice report, and then tick the box, I have done the task. But once you will have to start running and start implementing the things that you have raised in your diagnosis, then there is many, many, many people failing in that because they fear the failure, the criticism. And of course, they remain in this comfort zone that is not going to allow the company or the person itself 
to develop and to grow. These are comments, general comments, according to our view of why is it important diagnosis, but which are also the traps that are going to be blocking the possibilities of implementing the action plan. Well, you have decided now to implement, you are committed, you are engaged. So the other quality, the other feature you, you will have to uh, deploy and to develop is this flexibility. And that's very much linked not to the diagnosis thing, but to the application. Okay, so these two concepts are very important and are going to be guiding us over the next slides. Diagnosis is the willingness and ability to analyze the situation and assess the person's evolving needs to determine the most appropriate leadership style in relation to a specific task or a goal. A person's level of development should be assessed in relation to a specific activity or task. Okay, so we were talking about the diagnosis in the general aspect. Now, when we are talking about situational leadership, the diagnosis applies to the collaborator, to the worker. Okay, and in that sense, it is again very similar to the general principle of the diagnosis itself. It's related to this willingness and ability to analyze, to try to understand who do you have in front of you. In order to better tailor or to better define or make the click that is going to be necessary to push the collaborator in the right direction or to integrate the collaborator on your side. So once you have done this diagnosis, again, you will have to implement this action plan with him or her. And, and again, you should not be assessing or diagnosing that person in a general manner. You will have to focus on his or her potential performance on a specific activity or task. A collaborator, a worker in your company could be very, very good at doing something X or Y. But once you are assessing him or her, you will have to be very clear about what is this assessment good for? Why am I doing this? What do I pretend for this person to do? Then, depending on the task, that's going to be my sensibility, my feeling as a leader to understand how do I have to do this diagnosis for this specific task to this specific person. We will have to focus on competence and commitment. We can define competence as the knowledge and skills with respect to a task and objective. So we will have to analyze the profile of the worker, the collaborator we have in front of us. Which is his or her level of competence? Not the general competence, but what is going to be the right thing this worker can do? So again, we have to be very careful to be very attentively focusing our attention to test or to assess this specific competence according to the objective that we want to achieve. But that's not enough. One thing is the competence is the, well, the preparedness, the readiness that one might have to accomplish, to attempt to do a specific task. Commitment, it's a very different thing. And commitment can be this special key that can open many doors that may be closed in the past because nobody has been able of activating this commitment, this inner force that is giving sense and purpose to your actions. So commitment, it's this motivation, the self-confidence with respect to a task or a goal. Well, I can be very committed to climb Mount Everest. I can be very motivated, 
but perhaps I am overrating my capacities, my competences. So I need someone who is going to honestly tell me, well, I'm assessing your profile according to the tasks that you have to do, and I consider that for you, for these, 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 and these reasons, you should not be doing that, or you should be doing that. Because that is possibly reachable with your competence and the commitment, your conviction, your uh, trust in yourself, your self-confidence with regards to these tasks and goals. Let's go and let's dig a bit deeper about this concept of diagnosis, competence, knowledge and capacity. So competence, it's a measure of knowledge possessed and the ability to accomplish a task or achieve a goal. So then, knowledge is about knowing what to do. And capacity is about knowing how to do it. So you see that there are two different things here. You might be very good at knowing the theory of things. Perhaps you have read all the first pages of every book and you can tell everyone, look, I'm displaying a big knowledge on this, this, this and that from A to Z, from Alpha to Omega. But the different thing is knowing the theory and the other thing is knowing how to do it. You have, the you, you have read the first page of every book. You can show they have the knowledge. But have you experienced in your hands? Have you faced the challenge of doing something? That's another way of, know of, of knowing something by experience. The capacity. How to do it. I might have a lot of knowledge but I might not have the ability, the capacity to do it. When we are talking about transferable skills, we are talking about skills developed in other areas that can also be applied to the task by hand. For instance, programming skills, organizational skills, decision-making and problem-solving skills, being able to speak other languages, being able to use software, applications, etc. So those are the things that you can transfer. So are skills that you can apply to different uh, contexts. Again, commitment. Commitment, it's a measure of motivation and self-confidence to accomplish a task or goal. And the commitment, the measure of motivation, it's very interesting because you can be motivated by different, by different forces, by different drivers. Which are the main motivations that are guiding your actions? You can split your actions, you can split, you can try to understand your decisions daily. And you can put different categories of motivation according to what is driving your actions. Are there Intrinsic motivation, extrinsic motivations, transcendental motivations. Why are you doing what you are doing? What is the sense of what you are doing? That's going to be marking, impacting on your motivation. Do I have any extrinsic motivation? That means that I'm motivated by power, money that I can get out, out, out of a certain activity I can do is that your motivation can be a motivation. Many of us could be motivated by this extrinsic factor, by this extrinsic motivation. Or you might be intrinsically motivated to do something, which is a deeper layer of motivation. So you are not attracted by external material things, but you are attracted or driven by other layers of motivation, intrinsic motivation. Or are you moved or pushed by a deeper sense, by a deeper layer of motivation that could be this transcendental motivation? I could explain my work as a 
professor at university, why am I doing this? Am I doing this for the money? Of course I have to pay my bills. I have to support the family. Is that my main motivation? It's part of the motivations. Could I be happy in my work only by focusing my attention and my work just on this extrinsic aspect? Perhaps I will not find the right answer in terms of purpose and sense, on sense and sense of what I am doing. What I'm doing? Why am I doing this? I'm sharing my thoughts. I'm provoking you thoughts. I would like to push you outside your comfort zone. I want you to grow. As a professor, I'm trying to guide you. So, am I a leader? I could act as a leader from this point of view because I want you to develop as, as an individual. Am I interested in filling your head with theories? Or am I more interested in switching on a certain fire that is going to help you to try to understand you better? Am I interested in making you a better professional? Or am I interested in making you a better person? So perhaps if I am replying correctly to those questions, I might find more excitement, energy, stamina to do what I'm doing. That's the passion. This is the very reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. All right, so that's a very important thing when we are talking about our actions, to think about this commitment. How committed are you? Why are you committed? Which are those levels of motivation that are driven your action, dri driving your action? Are there extrinsic, materialistic type of drivers? With those, you are not going to be going far. Or are you having inner transcendental motivations? where you identify yourself in a role of a servant, giving your knowledge, your energy, your time to others to make them grow. Well, that's the things that we will have also always to, to think when we are doing whatever we, we do as a living. You can be a university professor, you can be an engineer, you can be a housekeeper, you can be a cleaner. Doesn't matter. You will have to reply to the same questions. To what point am I committed and why I'm doing what I'm doing? What's the final outcome of this? To whom I'm serving with my work? That's commitment. Having a real sense, the purpose of the action. Uh, now we are entering another interesting uh, phase of this uh, situation leadership and we have here something which is called development this is linked to the personal development and d1 d2 d3 and d4 are successive steps of sophistication so the d1 it's a beginner and the D4 is an expert. And the D2 and D3, they are the intermediate positions. Okay? So when we are talking about a person who is in the beginning of his or her career, or when they are trying something new, trying to learn something new, okay? Uh, their commitment is going to be very high. I really want to do this. It's new to me. It's going to be fantastic to take action and start. It's a motivation, there is high motivation and high trust. I'm very committed. But my level of competence in terms of knowledge and capacity from knowing what to do and how to do is still quite low. I'm learning, but I'm super motivated. So this is representing the first status of when we are studying a, a new thing. 
As long as we are progressing to stage two, the D2 development two, our commitment is going to decrease radically because we are going to say, okay, but I'm failing a lot of things. I'm not really understanding what is happening here. I'm getting a lot of criticism or bad feedback or whatever. So suddenly your, your commitment, your motivation and your trust in yourself starts curving. But conversely, your competence, your knowledge and capacity are growing. Okay, so there is a sort of compensation between this commitment and competence once you have surpassed, overcome this D1 and you are entering D2. There is an inversion of these uh, variables here where commitment is going down and competence, knowledge and capacity is going up. Once you are start realizing that, okay, you can put together competence, capacity, that you are start t uh, testing that things are working somehow, you are getting a better feedbacks, okay, you are getting more motivation and more trust, and therefore this commitment line starts to grow again. And it is growing basically in parallel to this uh, knowledge and capacity with this competence. And that's bringing to you towards sort of a summit, a situation where you could, at the end of a long period, to be considered an expert. In the D4, we can see here that the commitment is high, the motivation and trust in yourself is very high, because the competence, the knowledge and the capacity, what to do and how to do, it's very clear and it's very rooted in your own behavior and your, in your own routines. However, we can see also here this curvy, sneaky line that, of course, represents the up and downs you might have from D2 to D3 and D4. So it is not a constant growth. It is a situation where you have your up and downs and where you're learning and where your commitment and motivation might have a valley, and your, but your competence anyway is growing. Okay? because you are adapting new learnings and new strategies, new competences. Okay, so this is how more or less we can define the beginner stage to the expert stage in terms of how the commitment, motivation and trust and the competence, knowledge and capacity evolve over time. Commitment and competency. This is again Another visual representation of what we have described earlier on. So, in D1, you have low competence and you have high commitment, and you are in this developing stage. As, would you, as long as you are progressing, D1 and D2, you have low to some competence and low commitment for the reasons we have already stated earlier on. In D3, you have a moderate, high competence and a variable commitment. Right? This sneaky line was going up and down. And in D4, when you're an expert, you have this high competence and this high commitment. This In this quadrant here, you see basically the same, the commitment and the competency, this is the expert. This is low commitment and high competency. Low commitment, low competency, high commitment and low competency. Let's talk about the characteristics and the features of these different stages. In D1, the beginner, you have to be, it is more permissive, it's inexperienced, curious, new, optimistic, it's somehow anxious, eager, enthusiastic. So these are the main characteristics that define the behavior of a D1. When now the motivation is going down, 
the knowledge and the competencies are going up. In D2, you might feel overwhelmed, confused, demotivated, demoralized, frustrated, disillusioned, discouraged. But you are still becoming more skilled. Think about your personal experiences. Personal, I'm not saying here professional experiences. Personal experiences. In sports, in music, in whatever type of new task you might have an interest in. Close your eyes and try to imagine, try to recall how you lived those situations. Those memories may bring you back to school times, when you were requested to do something, or when you wanted to do something. How do you feel? How do you feel throughout your schooling time? Perhaps you were experiencing this progression, these characteristics, the way they were embedded, were rooted within you. The D3 is self-critical, doubtful, capable, contributor, insecure and apathetic. D4, the expert, it's confident, it's competent, inspired and inspires others. Expert, autonomous, self-sufficient, able to manage myself. So these are the main 